Hey guys, what's going on? I am Tim Burzens from Amplified Metabolism, and in part two of our gut microbiome series, we are going to be discussing different ways to decrease your total bacterial load in your large intestine. So we talked yesterday about how important the gut microbiome is, how interesting it is, how much it has an impact on your health, how there's all these different bacteria that can have all these different effects, creating these subtle changes in your physiology whenever you're eating food and whenever you're digesting the food, especially whatever makes it into that large intestine. So now the question might be, why would you want to decrease the bacterial load? If the gut microbiome has all these positive potential benefits, then wouldn't we wanna shift the balance? And the answer is of course, yes, we do want to shift the balance, but one of the quickest ways to do that is to start fresh, which means to clear out all the excess bacteria that we do not need. And that means to decrease your total bacterial load, bringing you back into a stable state of health where you're not having all of those byproducts from the bad bacteria affecting you. That alone can have huge impacts because it's going to be able to fix your liver health. It's going to be able to fix the inflammation and even your insulin sensitivity. That means now you're going to be digesting food better. And so now we're kicking off this cascade where if you're digesting food better, then the right nutrients are making it into the large intestine to feed the bacteria that need it and not the bad bacteria that have been clogging your system down. The ones that are producing the endotoxin and too much um, lactic acid and creating the leaky gut syndrome and all of those kind of things. Um, this video is also going to be really, really important for anyone who has a specific problem like a candida overgrowth or a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO because the information that we're going to be talking about is about reducing the entire load of bacteria to actually lower the, amount, the total amount of living bacteria in your system. So obviously, if you have some sort of overgrowth, uh, problem or, or you know, issue or symptoms or whatever, then that is going, this is going to be very good information for you. Now, of course, once we do clear out the bacteria and bring ourselves back to a stable base and we're in that better place where we can now um, you know, flourish the good bacteria so that we can accelerate our health higher, then yes, of course, we want to do things to actually help that along. But the first step that I think is so crucial, and it's not only a, a step, it's actually an ongoing thing because you really do wanna continually create that pressure towards less bacteria so that only the good ones are flourishing up and growing rather than letting them all grow wild and then get your system completely out of balance. So by doing these things on a regular basis, you're continuing to push things down and get your body back into a state of homeostasis where then the good bacteria can do what they're supposed to do and basically just, uh, it's like a routine wiping out of all of the stuff that you don't need. So with that, let's get into the actual practical steps that you can do to start reducing the amount of bad bacteria in your gut microbiome. So the first thing you can do is to start eating more insoluble fiber. Now, there are two different types of fiber, insoluble and soluble. And then broken down between those, there's also fermentable and infermentable fiber. Uh, we won't go into that too much right now, but the basics of that is certain fibers can be digested by your bacteria and, and uh, produce their own byproducts. Certain ones cannot be fermented. Typically, insoluble fibers are non-fermentable and soluble fibers are fermentable. Um, but that's not always the case. There are some fermentable insoluble fibers and there are also some non-fermentable soluble fibers. But specifically what we're talking about is insoluble fiber, just the entire class. So soluble fiber is the one that will uh, dissolve in water, absorb the water and turn into a gel. And this gel is slow moving through your system. Insoluble fiber, on the other hand, does not absorb water and instead passes through your system much more quickly. So you can kind of think of insoluble fiber like the gas that makes it go and soluble fiber like the brakes that slow it down. And when we're talking about digestion and when we're really talking about getting, uh, clearing out all the bacteria, having a little bit faster digestion is gonna help. If you have food that's sitting in your gut for a really long time, well, that's giving it more time for the bacteria to grow and for them to uh, interact and, and eat that extra food that hasn't been absorbed. Insoluble fiber will help things moving along, so it's like a stream of water. If a stream of water stops flowing, that's when it gets stagnant and it gets all mucky and murky, and it's kind of like that with your large intestine. If you can keep the stream flowing, then it stays fresh and stays clean because it has new material coming through it all the time. So when you think of insoluble fiber, I want you to think of veggies. So anything that is veggies typically has a lot of insoluble fiber. Things like broccoli and cauliflower, carrots, um, peas, these all have lots of insoluble fibers in them. And so that's a really good reason for you to make sure that you're eating your veggies. 
Um, and a couple other sources include potatoes and wheat bran or whole wheat. So all of those have a lot of insoluble fiber that helps to push things through your system. Now, one extra thing you can try with insoluble fiber is to actually eat these foods after your main meal at night when you have your big dinner. Because usually, you know, in America we have salad and then we have our main meal. But the, the French and the Italian actually have their salad after the main meal. And they believe that this improves digestion. And I would have to agree because if you have all of your main food getting digested and then you eat this insoluble fiber in the form of the salad, well, now you're gonna be helping to push through that meal rather than having it sit there in your gut. So it's something worth trying. Now, the second thing you can do to reduce the bad bacteria in your gut microbiome is to fast. Fasting basically means to abstain from calories, abstain from anything that uh, would, would add calories into your system. So that means usually it's just water. Some people use coffee or tea or um, sip on a couple of a variety of other things that do not have calories in them or keeping them very, very minimal at the least. Now, the reason this works is that whenever you eat a meal, it typically takes somewhere between a day and a half to two days to two and a half days, somewhere in that range to completely be excreted from your system. Now, it's a lot longer than we usually think because you eat the meal and then you just kind of forget about it. But six to eight hours from your stomach and your small intestine, and then there's something like 35 to 45 to 50 hours, somewhere in that range that the food is sitting in your large intestine. So when you fast and when you do not eat any food at all, basically what you're doing is giving a time where you can clear out your system, have nothing at all, no food in your large intestine, and therefore starve off the bacteria and allow them to die. And in fact, a lot of times when people do longer term fasts, like a three day fast or something, they will often notice some, uh, heart, some harder symptoms initially. They will go through like a sickness, they'll get uh, a stuffy nose and they'll feel kind of run down and they feel kind of tired and fatigued. And a big part of that is because the bacteria that was living in the large intestine is now not being fed. So this bacteria is dying, and a lot of those bacteria have a lipopolysaccharide shell around them. Lipopolysaccharide is what we're talking about when we say endotoxin. So when these bacteria die, they release the endotoxin, which then gets absorbed into your system and makes you feel like you have the flu. Now, ultimately, a really good thing is happening because you're reducing all of the bacteria that have those endotoxins. You're getting it out of your system. But during the fast, you have to get past that point. So every once in a while, it's a good idea to do a longer term fast, one to three days, somewhere in that range. Of course, make sure you're healthy enough to do this and make sure that uh, you know what you're doing. Don't jump into anything and don't do anything too extreme with it. I specifically would, would recommend doing a bone broth fast because then you're still getting some protein, you're getting some nourishment, but you're not actually giving anything to the large intestine, to the bacteria that would be eating those foods. If one to three days is, seems too long for you to try to do a fast, you can also do something uh, more on a daily structure, uh, which is something like intermittent fasting or even just an under eating, over eating cycle phase. And that basically means that during the day, you don't eat anything and then you have all your food at night. I'm going to do a whole nother video on this because I know a lot of you have been asking about, uh, been curious about my thoughts on that and, and how it fits into the larger paradigm of health. And um, there's some very interesting things I'm excited to share. So I'm going to hold off on talking too much about that. But in general, fasting is going to help you reduce the bacterial overload. Now, the third way is to supplement with activated charcoal. So activated charcoal is a substance that will adsorb, not absorb, but adsorb, A-D, uh, molecules onto its surface. So basically, rather than a mo it, when it comes in contact with a molecule, rather than sucking it in, it will just cling to it on the on its surface so when it goes through your system it's going to be clinging to molecules on its surface and passing them through your digestive system activated charcoal is not absorbed or digested it simply passes through now when you supplement with activated charcoal it will make its way down into your large intestine and it will start to adsorb those bacteria and therefore remove them from your system and take them out so that they're not there anymore now the important thing here obviously is that you want to do this on an empty stomach the reason being that if you eat food with the activated charcoal, it's just simply going to adsorb all of the nutrients that you want to be absorbing. And so you, what you really wanna do is first thing in the morning, supplement with your activated charcoal and wait about another hour or two before you eat anything else. That way it will pass through your system on its own. Uh, you'll be able to know because when you go to the bathroom, it will be, will be black. So you'll know that it's the activated charcoal because activated charcoal is really black and it passes straight through your system. And now the fourth and final way 
is to do a flush or if you're really inclined to do it an enema so a flush is basically when you drink something that your body does not really digest or it doesn't really uh, can't absorb all of it and so it passes it quickly through your entire system so the easiest way to do a flush is simply to do a salt water flush um, if you just add two to three grams of salt to uh, water dissolve it in the morning when you're on an empty stomach and uh, and drink it then it will pass through you and within half an hour to an hour you will be in the bathroom flushing it all out so of course you if you do this you want to make sure that you're near a bathroom you want to have a planned time where you don't have to go do something or run off and and uh, be distracted um, another way that you can enhance this is to mix coconut oil in with it because coconut oil the mcts inside of it uh, are antimicrobial. So when you flush it out of your system, you will also be flushing through that coconut oil, which will help to cleanse everything in your gut microbiome. Now, obviously a flush is done by drinking something and having it pass through your system. The enema is the opposite coming from the other, the other end of the spectrum. There have been many people who have reported really good results from doing a coffee enema. And a big re part of why this works is because you are cleaning out your large intestine. You're cleaning out all the excess bacteria that you don't need. And basically the reason is that you're creating an inhospitable environment for the bacteria for a short period of time and then clearing it out and going back um, to your normal day. So if that is something that interests you, you can of course try that, but I would first recommend trying the flush, doing the salt water on an empty stomach. You can also do this with magnesium citrate. Now with all of these things, a super important point is to do this carefully. Make sure you do your research because too much magnesium or too much salt can dehydrate you. It could cause vomiting if you have too much. It can cause some bad side effects and uh, we don't want any of those things to happen. So make sure that you do your research before you try one of these options. Now, one extra little benefit that you can do if you decide you wanna do a saltwater flush is to actually combine it with activated charcoal as well. Now, if you're doing a coconut oil activated charcoal saltwater flush, what's gonna happen is that that salt water is going to flush through your system, taking the activated charcoal, which is going to adsorb all of the uh, bacteria that are, it comes in contact with, and the coconut oil, which is going to be antimicrobial to kill all of those bacteria, all of those are going to pass down into your large intestine without getting absorbed and therefore have a more potent effect. So that is definitely something that if you're considering doing a flush, I would definitely recommend adding that activated charcoal to get a little bit of a better benefit from it. So there you have it guys, the top four ways to decrease the bacteria, especially the bad bacteria in your large intestine, in your gut microbiome, and allowing your body to come back to a stable place where it can now heal and begin digesting better and improving insulin sensitivity, getting everything back on track so that you can now support the good bacteria to grow to really get those enhanced benefits. Now, like I said, this is part two of a series. We're gonna be talking about the gut microbiome all week long. So if you like this video and you wanna uh, keep up with all of the uh, next videos in this series, then please hit subscribe. If you like to give me the thumbs up, share it with anyone who wants to, uh, who you think might like this and leave any comments if you have anything to say. I also have a Patreon account in the about section of this video. If you feel like giving a few dollars, head over there. Uh, any of your support will be much appreciated, but of course, no obligation to do so. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful day. I hope you all keep your guts nice and healthy. Uh, let me know if any of you try any of these things. I would love to get any feedback and uh, continue the discussion on there. With all of that, I'm going to get out of here. Peace.